Um, implementation in in most Whitehall departments is the only thing that has uh, I, think, I think the only thing that has slightly lower level of priority in all Whitehall departments, in my experience, than implementation of whatever the policy is, is writing speeches for ministers, which really is you know right down there somewhere, and. Uh, it's the trip that gets played on the apprentice who walks through the door, you know, the, the, the lousy job that you give the new boy, write the speech for the minister. So we just have to rewrite them all. It's not a skill that's valued in any Whitehall department, is communicating outwards, it's not valued. Um, policy making is. So there's a lesson here. One of the ways you can get your policy taken seriously is by getting in at the right level, official level, and persuading them that it's a good thing. They, all departments, consult. They love evidence-based policy making and they consult like mad. Northern Ireland office, in Northern Ireland because of the political situation there, they consulted literally till they were blue in the face. I mean, and then they consult again because they had to be absolutely sure that, that whatever it was they would do. When I went over there as a children's minister, they, had a, they were developing a 10-year policy on a 10-year plan to improve the lives of children. It take them five years. And it hadn't been published. And I was saying, we could have implemented half of it by now, you know. And they looked at me uh, rather like I was a bit at one of these over-enthusiastic new ministers that had just arrived. Anyway, I, I, I uh, had it published within a few weeks. I rewrote most of it myself, which is another lesson. It just needed a bit of tweaking. Um, and, and we tweaked it. Now, so ministers can have an impact. That's the other place you should you should uh, you should tap in, and that's and that is at ministerial level. Let me give you an example, and it part an example from from my time at DWP, where I was for four years as a minister for disabled people. We had a manifesto commitment to in, improve any, uh, the civil rights of disabled people to actually bring them up to the standard they should have been at. This was a manifesto commitment that, that had been taken very seriously. We'd had years in opposition of fighting with disabled people's organisations, the trade union movement, learning from the experience of their members. So we knew more or less what it was that we wanted to do. We set a disability rights task force that had everybody on it to come up with the actual detailed policy. Um, and we were going ahead with implementing that. We got it all done in the 2005 legislation which we got through uh, in the wash-up of the end of, absolute the end of the 2001-2005 Parliament on the last day we got that legislation, which completed our entire manifesto commitment. However, I was wandering around talking to various people, some of whom were Joe's members, and some of whom were, uh, were, were from other disabled and deaf organisations. And I was told that it would be very nice if British Sign Language, which is a, a language, could be recognised as such. And, and I thought, well, that can't be hard. It sounds like a good idea. It is a language. Linguists will say that it's a language. What's the problem with that? Uh, it wasn't something that had been raised before. And so I said, oh, well, it wouldn't even cost very much, would it? That's always a very good... If you've got policy, it doesn't cost anything. That is perfect. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about priorities if there's no cost. That's perfect for any minister. Uh, they'll jump at any policy that doesn't cost anything. Um, I would. So I thought BSL recognition, that's got to be good. It, it helps with esteem, the esteem of the deaf and, uh, community. Because of their language, they see themselves as a linguistic minority, and I didn't understand this until I started talking to deaf people, uh, prelingually deaf people. They see themselves as a linguistic minority, not as disabled people. It's like, well, just speak our language, like you would if an Italian came to see you. And it figures, doesn't it, once you think about it, sort of think about it. So why not recognise the language? Other minority languages are recognised. Uh, they're recognised in Europe. Uh, but not sign languages, I discovered. Anyway, I found out that because of um, educational issues in respect of deaf children and cochlear implants, there was an educational kind of resistance in that world to recognising BSL as a language. And so uh, when I went away and said, Oh, we should do this, doesn't cost anything. I tried to get cross-government agreement to do it. Uh, the Department for Education and, and Skills uh, said, mm -hmm, I don't think we can do that, Minister. It sends all the wrong signals to the parents of deaf children who, who, who might want to insist that they get to learn BSL instead of having cochlear implants, and we think they should have cochlear implants. 
Anyway, so we had to solve that problem with the usual cross-government structures. But the point of all of this is, um, there was no manif manifesto policy on that. That was something I just came across as a minister by talking to Joe's members and others out there in the deaf community and other campaign groups in the uh, disability community who all supported it. Um, it arose out of the experience of Joe's members and, uh, and, and the members of, of, of other organisations who came to talk to me about it. And I decided we're going to do it. So I pushed it. I pushed it against the resistance of civil servants who weren't opposed to it per se. It just didn't, it wasn't in their briefing in the department of what was important to them. They knew another department was against it, and so they, they, they didn't want to do all the work. They had a different agenda that, that was just our agenda, our manifesto agenda. I'm not saying they were trying to implement Tory policies or any such thing. It just meant that some people who were working on this would have to go and talk to other civil servants in other departments about something that I'd dreamed up that they weren't that interested in. It wasn't on their agenda. But I elbowed them and pushed them and shoved them, and they did. They went to talk. We got this sorted out. And so there was cross-government agreement. Um, it's important to get the Secretary of State's uh, uh, help with this if you're a junior minister. If You can't do all that without the Secretary of State supporting you, otherwise it will get stopped at a higher level and you've wasted your time. We then found a bit of money, which we could do in those days, to support an announcement that we were doing this, to help uh, give some real credence to the fact that we were doing it and say that we meant it, and we did it. Now that's something that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't noticed by talking to people that it was something that was important, but it was too small a thing to be a big headline policy that would go in the manifesto by itself. But it was something that was important, and whenever I go around to deaf and disabled communities now, it's always raised with me as something that was a real turning point, something that was very important. Wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had some uh, minister realising by talking to people that it was important. And that, I think, is why um, I'm really interested to hear what Martin's union has been doing with the policy-making process, because it's that democratic legitimacy, that bottom-up push, that taking people's experience of life and therefore understanding from that what change can mean and what changes should be prioritised that ministers don't always have below the big ticket manifesto items. So to the extent that unions can develop better ways of doing that, then I think, certainly with Labour ministers, you're going to have no trouble pushing um, some ministerial input. The other way is to make sure you're on the, uh, the list of important stakeholders that at an official level mm -hmm. government departments will engage <coughs> with. There's always a list. I always ask for it. Where's the list of, we've consulted minister. Where's the list of who you consult? Always the same people. One of the things minister, ministers can do is put other people on the <coughs> list. One of the things that you can do is get on the list. Because actually, that's one yeah. way of plugging in. These seem like really stupid, silly things, but actually it can be the difference between getting your ideas in to the policy-making process to, through the consultation, being consulted, can be the difference between that and just coming up against the great brick wall that can be Whitehall. So I hope that gives you a few little ideas. Um, and ministers, if they've got any sense, welcome some input from outside of the Whitehall uh, uh, straitjacket, because I get loads of advice. I'm not suggesting for a minute that any of it's wrong or given to me with evil intent. Civil servants do their job, but they do it from their little project team in their little bit of their little bit of the department that's doing such and such a thing. They don't look up. They don't see the strategic picture necessarily. It's not their job to. It's, it's my job, my job to see some of that. And so to the extent that we can get a wider perspective that's democratically come up from the ground, plugged into that, I think it makes better policy making. And, and I don't need to see it, find any Labour minister who didn't agree with that. So I hope that gives you a few clues.